Hello everyone and good day and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on the future of social care in Wales being hosted by the Wales Government Centre at Cardiff University. Uh, we're delighted that so many of you are able to join us to discuss this one of the most important issues for social policy in Wales over the coming years. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Tricky. I'm an honorary research fellow at the Wales Governance Centre and I'll be chairing the event. I'm joined today by Kian Sean, who has led the social care work at the Governance Centre. And we're especially delighted to have as our panelists, the older People's Commissioner for Wales, Helena Herklotz and Lance Carver, the Director of Social Services for the Vale of Glamorgan, who is here representing the Association of Directors of Social Services in Wales. So thank you both very much uh, for joining us uh, today. Some housekeeping. Um, first, I should say that this event is being recorded for the Wales Government Centre archives. Um, apart from the panellists, everyone's microphones are muted and cameras switched off when they enter the meeting. Uh, but we encourage you to use the chat function to introduce yourselves to each other and as important to use the Q&A function to ask the panel or Kian questions, either by posting them publicly or messaging the host. You can submit questions either in English or Welsh. So please, please get, get those questions coming. Uh, before we get down to business, I thought I should say something about why the Wales Government Centre, which isn't known as a social policy think tank, should be hosting this webinar at all. Uh, the background is this. One of the centre's main areas of work is the Wales Fiscal Analysis Programme, um, which uh, was established in its current form a couple of years ago to provide independent briefing and analysis on public finances in Wales, uh, devolved as well as non-devolved. Our papers are intended to be of use to politicians, people working in government or public services, civil society, or more widely anyone who wants to find out what is happening with public spending and taxation in Wales. So for example, um, the programme has published this week a briefing paper on the Welsh Government's fiscal response to COVID-19. In the run-up to last year's general election, some of the political parties uh, advocated the introduction of free personal care for older people and we began to look at what the cost of free personal care would be for Wales. To do this, we had both to look at the experience of Scotland, as well as educate ourselves about how social care in Wales is resourced. And the result is two papers that we have published this autumn about which Kian will be speaking shortly. One looks at the, how social care in, for older people is currently resourced in Wales and some of the policy issues which arise the other looks at the specific issues around free personal and nursing care. So we have come at this from a fiscal and economic perspective. I must stress that we are not social care experts, but we hope those of you who are, um, perhaps many of you today, will find what we have to say a helpful contribution. So first I'm going to ask Kian Sean to present some of the key findings from the work. After that, we will open up discussion to our panel and then to your questions. So please put your questions uh, uh, down using the Q&A function. As soon as you think of the question, don't wait for anybody to, uh, to you know, on any ceremony. Um, so as many questions as possible, please. So Kian, would you like to lead us off with the, the presentation, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna try and share a screen with you now, and let's see if that works. Hopefully it will. <clears throat> cool, so I'm going to start with a short presentation on the findings from our recently published reports, looking at the challenges uh, associated with resourcing the sector, and as Michael said, uh, what lessons might be drawn if we were to introduce free personal care in Wales uh, along similar lines to Scotland. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, calls to reform social care are nothing new. Um, but often when politicians talk about fixing social care, the focus is really on the arrangements governing how people pay for care. Uh, and though that is important, um, as we'll see later, it's perhaps only a part of the jigsaw. 
So uh, last month in his virtual conference speech, uh, Boris Johnson talked about fixing the injustice of care home funding by bringing the magic of averages to the rescue of millions. So alluding to this idea that a scheme where everyone contributes can mitigate the risk that any given person will be out of pocket when paying for care. Uh, Vaughan Gething put it perhaps a bit more bluntly when he said that if you want dignity, if you want quality in the care that's provided, uh, you have to find a way to fund that. And if anyone is any, has any doubts about whether now is the time to invest in social care, given the current state of public finances, uh, Jeremy Hunt, the former UK Health Secretary, certainly doesn't seem to think so. Uh, as, he recent put, as he recently put it, uh, we were even more bankrupt in 1945 when we decided to sort out the NHS. So it's clear that there's cross-party acknowledgement of the need for reform. Uh, whether that translates into political will to act is perhaps another matter. Um, but any reform uh, will have to grapple with more than just about who pays care, uh, who pays for care alone. In fact, in our work, we identified at least four key areas that future policy will need to grapple with. So I'll outline each of these in turn and then go into a bit more detail later. Uh, first is the need to address the level of resourcing required to deliver effective care services. The second thing that needs to be considered is the currently fragmented nature of care provision. Third, and I think this is something that has really been uh, brought to the fore by the pandemic, is the extent of low pay within the sector, uh, whether that reflects the value of the work being done uh, and what knock-on effect that has as well on recruitment and staff retention. And then fourthly, you've got the ever-present challenge of forecasting and meeting future demand, bearing in mind as well that people's uh, preferences for different types of care or care in different settings may change or shift over time as well. But I'm going to begin by talking through this chart, uh, which gives an overview of the way care is resourced in Wales uh, and the different funding flows involved. And as you might expect, the picture is actually quite complex. Uh, this chart shows the estimated spending on adult social care in 2015-16. Uh, I should note that these figures also include spending on care for younger adults as well. Um, but on the left, you have estimates of spending on care by the voluntary sector uh, and spending on privately purchased care. But if we focus on the red bars, you can see that public funding on care involves two quite separate strands of funding that are not linked in policy terms. You've got, on the one hand, the non-devolved DWP benefit system, uh, which delivers fiscal transfers to individuals to help with care needs whether that's through uh, DLA, PIP, um, the attendance allowance payments, and you've got the formal care services that are funded through devolved spending, uh, mainly local authorities and the NHS in Wales. And I think a key takeaway here is that even though social care is a devolved function, uh, DWP pay payments are also actually still a very important recourse for adults who are uh, required to contribute towards their care needs. So it follows from that, that you know, any changes in eligibility or assessment for those benefits, that's gonna have a, a real knock-on effect on the way people access care in Wales. And of course, since they are fiscal transfers, not all of it will be spent directly on meeting care needs, um, but much of it will, uh, and some of it will also end up being paid uh, to local authorities in the form of user contributions uh, for care services. But actually, that's all just scratching the tip of the iceberg if you compare the spending to the estimated replacement cost of all informal adult care that's provided by friends and families. So that's basically the amount of money that you'd need to spend uh, to purchase that care at market price. Um, and I should highlight that, you know, it is subject to quite a lot of uncertainty, um, but there are a couple of estimates that have placed the figure in the region of £8 billion on this. And that would be of a similar order of magnitude to the annual size of the NHS Wales budget. So I think it's clear that any strategy for reforming older adult care, it must recognise the key role played by the informal care sector uh, and acknowledge the pressures that providing long-term care can put on family resources as well. And at the same time, you know, if you do make changes to how people pay for care, whether it's free personal care or another policy, if you make those funding arrangements more generous, you might find that there's actually quite a lot of latent demand there as well. So I think it's important to keep this picture in mind. Um, 
But nevertheless, devolved public spending on care in Wales is largely done through local authorities. Uh, local authorities have seen, of course, significant cuts to their grants funding over much of the past decade. Um, even though social care was actually one of the relatively better protected local authority service areas, what we've seen is much of the additional funding that councils made available for social care has been absorbed by cost pressures, uh, particularly in children and family services, for instance. So this chart shows spending on residential care for older adults, uh, though the picture is similar for home care services as well. And if you look at the grey line, uh, so that's the line having adjusted for inflation, you can see that the overall trajectory has been flat. And that's despite the growth in the over 65 cohorts over that period. So actually, you know, if you account for the aging population, uh, spending per head on older adult care has actually decreased over that period. Uh, the second thing is that when it comes to the delivery of care, like the rest of the UK, uh, that's done through a mix of private and public providers. In the residential sector, there are around a thousand operators across Wales. Most of them are in the independent sector, as you can see from the graph. Uh, in fact, Cardiff, Torvine and Powys uh, don't have any local authority run care homes. Uh, but nevertheless, most residents in Wales will continue to have their care either fully funded or funded in part by local authorities. Now, there is a national system for regulating and inspecting these care homes, but the delivery of the services is quite fragmented. So you've got multiple employers, uh, you've got no single body for determining pay, and that may partly explain the difficulty the Welsh Government had in paying that £500 care bonus earlier this year. And also the setup of the marketplace means that you've got individual negotiations between commissioners uh, and the independence providers on the price that local authorities pay for care. And often that price will fluctuate uh, depending on the part of the country that care home is based. Um, one of the things that came out from our research was that there are concerns that the fees paid by local authorities are not particularly, to independence care homes, that they're not particularly economic and that providers might be therefore increasingly relying on what we call cross-subsidy by self-funders as a result. So uh, effectively what this means is that fees paid by private residents might be being used to partly cover the cost of care for local authority funded residents. We know that actually on a UK level, uh, fees for private self-funded places are on average 41% higher than those paid for local, uh, than for the places paid by local authorities even though the services received are going to be broadly the same. Um, and if that's true, there are implications to that because you know, if public resourcing doesn't cover the cost, then that incentive to invest in new care home places, that might not be there, even if demand is projected to increase in the future. So it's very likely that future policy will have to address the way residential care is currently delivered. Uh, the third aspect, that policymakers will surely need to consider is the extent of low pay within the sector. So we estimate, based on data from the annual population survey, that fewer than half of the personal care workforce in Wales are paid the real living wage, uh, as defined by the Living Wage Foundation. I think that's currently set at £9.30 uh, an hour. And actually, if you look at other parts of the UK, the picture is broadly similar, Scotland being a bit of an exception. Um, and if you look over a decade, there's been little improvement in that pay over that time. In fact, if you account for inflation, median pay has lagged even further behind the real living wage in recent years. And one of the reasons why that's so pernicious is because that issue can be seen across the earnings distribution. So if you look at this chart, you can see that nearly 70% of workers engaged in residential care in Wales are paid less than £10 an hour. Uh, earnings are substantially lower than for human health activities, including NHS workers, across all percentiles. But even if you compare just with the uh, service industry average, you can see that wages in the residential care sector are still much lower across that earnings distribution. Now, of course, the need to address that is made even more urgent by the fact that we know that has an unequal impact. We know that uh, approximately four in five care workers in Wales are women. And I think a lot of the reason perhaps why pay is so low in the sector is because of the way society has maybe historically normalised caring as being 
uh, unpaid work or something that happens in the household. Uh, even today, that idea of caring as an activity that largely takes place outside the labour market, that's still very much embedded in public perception, I think. Um, but on the other hand, you know, the pandemic has arguably created that space possibly to reassess the social value of occupations like social care uh, and how that squares with the price that we currently pay workers uh, for their labour in those sectors. And fourthly, uh, it's also critical that we consider how demand for different types of care uh, are likely to change in the future. Uh, over recent years, we've seen a shift towards people receiving more hours of care at home. Um, but one aspect where uh, the provision of home care might be more difficult is for the very frail, or for instance, for those suffering from more severe forms of dementia. So this chart uh, shows the growth in the number of older adults claiming attendance allowance for dementia. Um, and actually, if you looked at the total number of people claiming attendance allowance in Wales, that actually peaked in 2009 and has fallen since then. So if I was to plot that on this graph, that would be a downward sloping line. But as you can see from the red line, the number of claimants with dementia has continued to grow. Uh, and actually in recent years, uh, that has outpaced the growth, the overall growth in the over 65 population. Now, admittedly, that can reflect a couple of things. It could reflect a growing prevalence of dementia, or it could just improve, uh, reflect improvements in the way we diagnose certain conditions. Um, but in any case, I think increased prevalence or improved understanding of this or any other conditions, that could lead to additional demand for residential placements going forward. So that's why I think it's critical that our care system is able to adapt to accommodate demand and crucially demand for care in different settings uh, as well. So one way uh, that's been put as uh, one way of reforming how people current, currently pay for care is to offer personal care for free to older adults. Uh, and that's exactly what Scotland did back in 2002. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like to clarify with this policy, because I don't think it's immediately obvious from the title. Uh, but as introduced in Scotland, free personal care was actually not a universal entitlement. So in order to be eligible, uh, you had to go through an assessment of needs conducted by local authority. And also, if you were receiving residential care, uh, it doesn't cover the, hotel, cover the hotel costs or the hotel charges, so the cost of food and accommodation of the better off. Uh, and those hotel charges can account for up to three quarters of residential care fees. So I think it's important to bear in mind that some people will still be making significant contributions towards the cost of their care under this policy as well. Um, but when that policy was introduced in Scotland, there was an initial surge in demand. Uh, the numbers receiving public funds for home care increased by around 50% between 2002 and 2007. Um, though perhaps counterintuitively, the numbers have flattened out uh, since then. Um, the additional cost of providing free personal care then in Scotland is estimated to be around 480 million in 2017-18. Now, there's a couple of difficulties with coming up with the cost estimates for this policy in Wales. Um, if you were to take a crude per capita pro rata estimate, which takes into account the slightly larger over 65 cohorts that we have in Wales, that would give you an estimate in the region of £300 million a year. But there are a couple of factors that complicate that. So firstly, we know that the Welsh Government has already made some policy changes to limit social care costs. So the capping of home care charges at £100 a week and increasing the asset threshold from 25 to 50,000, that means that the starting point for Wales would be a bit different to Scotland. And what that means is that effectively, some of the costs of implementing this policy are probably already baked into the Welsh Government's budget. And so any additional costs required to implement the policy may, may therefore be lower. Um, we also know that the private market is smaller in Wales, accounting for around 30% of care home fees compared to around 35% in Scotland. And that could also drive the cost down because more people are already receiving their care, either fully or partly funded by local authorities. Um, on the other hand, there's some evidence that higher prevalence of frailty and disability could be a factor driving up costs. Um, but our best guess, guess is that the additional cost 
to the Welsh Government would probably be less than that £300 million figure. Uh, and that £300 million figure, by the way, would represent around 1.5% of the Welsh Government's day-to-day -day budget. So you might think, you know, in normal times, that might be feasible if it was a top budget priority. Uh, of course, in times of COVID, maybe the need to balance different priorities uh, are almost certainly greater. So I'm going to finish there. I'm going to outline a few policy lessons that could be drawn from my research. First, as I've said, reforming the sector must mean more than just rethinking who pays what and how. If we do want to ensure that care staff are properly compensated for their work, you know, if we want to accommodate the growth in complex care needs, and if we want to ensure that local authorities are able to adequately cover the cost of residential care, that means that overall levels of resourcing are almost certain, uh, certainly going to have to increase. Um, there's arguably a need to address the current fragmentation within the sector. Uh, that might involve uh, a greater role for local authorities or the Welsh Government to play, or it might just simply involve having, having a more consistent approach to the marketplace across Wales. But of course, who pays is important. Uh, there may well be merits to an insurance-based scheme or uh, a free personal care offer, but it's important to recognise that in order for any of these policies to be effective, you'd also need to make sure that the care services are able to expand accordingly to accommodate any subsequent increase in demand as a result of that policy. Um, but ultimately, it does seem almost certain that government spending on care will have to increase in the future. Uh, so there's a couple of questions for the Welsh Government then. Uh, how do they fund that increase in spending? Do they wait for consequentials from a decision in England? Uh, do they reallocate funds from existing priorities? Or do they perhaps explore new revenue raising streams? Uh, and perhaps we can talk a bit more about those options and the weaknesses and the strengths of each one uh, later. Um, but I'm going to stop, stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to our guest panellists today and I'm going to hand over to begin with to Helena. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kian, and um, thanks for the really good presentation, very data rich, so lots, lots to draw on from there. So I'm going to really start by talking about why social care matters, and it matters to us all, because actually each and every one of us at some point in our lives is likely to need social care, either for ourselves or a loved one. And social care services, let's remember, help us to live well, to have the best possible quality of life possible, to cope with what life throws at us, onset of disability, a long-term condition like dementia, the need for support for our mental health. And I'd argue that it's an essential part of our society and our economy and should be viewed, I believe, as part of the infrastructure of a decent society, along with the NHS and on an equal footing to the NHS. But of course, social care costs. But when we look at the cost of social care and funding it, I think we also need to look at the other side of the equation, which is the costs of not funding it properly. The cost to us as individuals, to our families and to society. It means if we don't have properly funded social care, older people are struggling to get by, to look after themselves if they need care. We will see unpaid carers facing breaking point damaging their own health uh, and their own futures. We will see people having to give up paid work in order to provide unpaid care for loved ones, which means issues for themselves in the future because they may not have been able to build up pensions. So it might mean that their older age is one of poverty, but it also has an economic consequence because if they're giving up work, they're not paying tax, they're not contributing to the economy in that way. Uh, and it has, of course, huge consequences for their own mental health as well. So we need to sort the funding of social care and we've needed to for years, for decades. Um, but I do believe we have a particular opportunity to do that now. And I reflected on, on the four issues that, that Keon raised with us, but I think there's an important fifth one, which is about the availability, the access and the quality of social care. And importantly, ensuring that older people's legal rights to social care are met. And I question how easy that is uh, at the moment for those things to be met. So I want to offer sort of four, four challenges really that we, we need to look at. And the first of these is 
the issue about information and advice and access to care. It's a very complex system to navigate and any of us who have to do that for ourselves or our loved ones would know that. Just as an illustration, H Cymru produced a fantastic fact sheet on paying for a care home place and it's 70 pages long. So we have a system that is so complex to navigate through. And quite often the decisions we're making about social care, we're making in a crisis where someone's maybe had a stroke or no longer able to manage at home. And navigating your way through a mixed economy of care is very difficult. You can't shop around in the way you might uh, for normal goods and services. So is the market working well for older people? Well, I don't believe it is. We have a number of issues that are pretty fundamental. In care homes, we have situations where those who are paying privately might be cross subsidizing those who are being funded by the state because that level of funding isn't high enough to meet the costs of a care home. So we have an inequity there to start with. We have significant supply side issues. In other words, the supply of services and support that we need, that our older population needs, are not always there or in the right place or available. So we need a strategic approach to commissioning between and within the public, independent and private sector. So that's the first issue. The second is the issue of costs. From all the work I've done on this and, and talking with older people and families over years, many people actually don't know that social care is not free. They don't know that it's different from the NHS. And people are suddenly faced with a very complex and difficult system to navigate and one which calls on their own resources. And it's also, I believe, a fault line between better integration between the NHS and social care, because one part of the system you have to pay for and one you don't. And if we're serious about better integration between the NHS and social care, we, I think, have to move towards free personal care. And there's also simply the issue of fairness. Is it fair that if you develop dementia or a serious illness and disability, you can face pretty well catastrophic costs just because you need that care and support. And as I said at the beginning, social care is something that all of us are likely to need at some point for us or our loved ones. So this has to be an area for pooled risk. The third issue which Kian touched on is support for unpaid carers. Most of the care provided is not by social care or by the NHS. It's me and you and our families and friends. It's always been that way and it always will be that way. But unless now we have a significant shift to better support for unpaid carers, there will be many hundreds, many thousands of people who really struggle to get by and who face enormous physical and mental health consequences for themselves because of the burden of caring. We need better respite. We need better support into people's homes. We need better support for carers. And I think we need to see a shift in this, not incremental improvements now, we need a shift in recognition and support of carers. And if we don't, it will have economic as well as societal consequences. And the fourth area is about valuing the people who need this care and the people who provide it. And frankly, the system suggests as it is that we don't value those people enough. And I think that's partly to do with issues of ageism and partly to do with issues of sexism and the fact that social care is predominantly uh, a profession uh, for women at the moment. So we need, I believe, to sort the workforce issues to make sure people are paid for the high skill work this is. And we mustn't allow any debate and talk about low skill and low pay. This is a highly skilled area of work. We need to make sure that we fund the right models and types of services and support. And that must be led by what older people and their families tell us is important and tell us is needed. We have to have a system that at its heart respects and supports people's individual legal and human rights. And then as we build that, we need to put in place the funding in addition to enable free personal care to be provided 
with the cost of accommodation, uh, board and lodgings, if you like, in care homes, and costs that you would face in your own home being met by the individual on a means tested basis. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena. Lots to think about there. Um, I'm going to go to Lance Carver now, um, the uh, Director of Social Services in the Vale of Glamorgan, who has much responsibility for the operational side of how all this takes place. So Lance, your, your reflections, please. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, uh, Helena and uh, Kian. Uh, Helena, I'm really relieved your, your presentation chimes very well with mine, so I will try not to duplicate, but um, I, I, I suppose the, the, the kind of primary issue for me really is, is about making sure we've got um, sufficient volume of the right kind of care models available for, for people. And I think, you know, what was really apparent within Kian's presentation is lots of emphasis on residential and, and, and nursing care. And I suppose, but we, we have a lot of alternatives available to those or, or could develop more alternatives to those, I suppose. So such as extra care, supported accommodation uh, uh, and so on. Many, many of which actually allow individuals to have greater autonomy and independence. Uh, and, and I suppose to, to my mind, if we're, if we're at the point of, of putting uh, or making arrangements to, to put somebody into a care home and without having first kind of gone through those those less um, uh, sort of intensive uh, and um, uh, options, uh, I, I I think I think there's something wrong, and I think I think that's probably the position we're in at the moment. There isn't that breadth uh, across every single uh, type of uh, model. Um, I think I think there's a lot that we we are doing and need to continue to do uh, with regard to reablement and rehabilitation. Uh, I think you know. Uh, I think it was Helena quite rightly said a lot of people are, are making very very serious decisions about where they're going to live and how they're going to receive their care at, at probably one of the most critically worst times of their lives uh, and, and I think the the most that we can do to actually help people get get their feet back on the ground and back to some normality the the, the better and that our services need to to concentrate on on, on those um, I'm sure Helena will forgive me, but the the issue isn't just older people. Um, the issue the issue um, relates across the entire care sector. Um, yeah, adults with learning difficulties have have sig significant set of uh, of different different um, models for for how their care needs can be met, and I think there's a, probably a lot we could could learn from from there. Uh, I, I know we don't want to go too much into COVID-19, but one of the clear emerging um, areas of demand is, is uh, to meet the, the mental health needs of the population, but most notably for children and young people. Uh, and that to me is a, a, a real concern at, at the moment. I suppose the other the other thing I want to talk about quickly was quality. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we, we rightly been highlighted variation in quality across across the care system there there are some amazing services out there but there are some that that really ha have let people down at certain times um and i suppose the the thing that i don't think is always aware in in this um kind of uh, how, do you, how do you describe it? A, a mixed texture of services um, is that actually it tends to come back to the local authority when things don't work uh, as it should do. So, so the local authority would have been responsible for for the commissioning of of a placement, and so it would would go, come back. Um, I think in in terms of of the variation in costs for services, so uh, I think Kian picked picked up in in, in terms of that, uh, and we certainly see that between local authority areas, but we see that significantly within local authority areas as well, and and for different client groups and different types of accommodation. I think I think that is real. Um, I think though those costs are different. Um, if you're setting up a care home now and you're having to buy land and premises and so on and get investment, your costs are going to be much higher than the business that's been running for 30 years and has fully paid off its it, it, its mortgage uh, and and so on. So I I suppose that the the approach that we take at the moment is is guided by Welsh government through the Let's Agree to Agree toolkit. Um, so so I think there is probably growing consistency across Wales in terms of of, of 
the methods used to 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 work those those different amounts out um, and i i suppose you know we we have significant difference when we when we look at those we we're, we're very i'm very fortunate in in my local authority area that we have a lot of local providers who who are local uh businessmen and women who who have worked really hard and are clearly motivated by actually wanting to care and support people primarily um we also have uh in some cases across across the entire care system um operations that i can't work out who owns them um and that are um uh, essentially responsible to multiple shareholders who seem to take significant dividends that that there seems to be a massive chasm between those two 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 in in my mind um and i think uh, the the other thing i was just going to reiterate i suppose was um a point that i think kian made in relation to to um any changes driving behavior and demand um, we saw that significantly when the cap for uh, non-residential charging was was introduced it, it brought huge numbers of people into the, the local authority to have their care arranged when they were previously managing those arrangements independently um, and so so i suppose any changes that we would make are likely to have a, a similar uh, effect uh, on on the different areas that we would need uh, um, uh, sufficient volume for um, and i i I was really pleased that um, Helena stole my thunder for the next bit, but um, the the bit about the 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 kind of integration between health and social care and the significant divide that having one service provided freely and another one provided being uh, through through charging is is huge and cannot be understated. So. I, I, I think we hear a lot of uh, drives for pooled budgets, single arrangements uh, and so on, while two separate systems exist and, and individuals require that individual assessment because to, to them as an individual can have a massive difference as to whether they pay for their care or, or not, uh, so whether it's funded freely by the NHS or, or has, has to be paid for uh, to, to the local authority we still have to make those determinations. And so actually any pooling of budgets is, is an illusion because actually it always comes back to, it has to be paid by one or the other through, through, through a clear legislative and assessment process. So, so I, the idea that we may get to a point that that was no longer needed um, would, to my mind, really enable us to operate as a far more integrated service. Um, and I suppose the final point I was I was going to to make, um, because I, I suppose I'm aware that that you know some some of this probably um, could lead people to think that actually a national system is is required um, that will somehow make this equitable across the entire country in terms of how how costs are are evaluated and, and paid. Um, is that almost every guidance document I have received from Welsh Government in the last 10 years has pointed to locally driven uh, community-based solutions uh, where the individuals uh, who is receiving the service gets to focus on the goals and, and outcomes that they they want. I really fear that the more we centralise that the, the, the further it, it would push us away from, from, from that position. Um, and so I, th I think I'll probably stop there because uh, I've probably said enough. Thank you very much, Lance. And um, actually, between the two of you, you really have covered quite a bit of bit of territory. And not surprisingly, we've uh, got quite a few questions that have come in from uh, from uh, participants. So I'm going to have to. I'm going to, uh, and I hope that people who have asked questions won't won't mind. I'm going to kind of uh, collapse a couple of the questions from different people in, in, into a kind of uh, into a key point. Um, I want to start off with um, some comments from Steve Martin and, and Gary Gibbs who are really getting at the same sort of issues. Uh, we've been debating um, the financing and reform of social care for many years and actually uh, you would Steve, the progress has been limited um, and both of the Questioners are saying, to what extent is this about intergenerational fairness? Um, so that governments and politicians find it more difficult to focus on one particular uh, age cohort as against 
Um, for instance, as uh, I think Lance was talking about earlier on, uh, adults as a whole. And I'm just wondering to what extent you, you think this has been an issue in, in why politicians have found it difficult to, to make big progress on the kind of social care issue. Helena. Um, so, I think there's, there's, there's two, two issues to unpack here. First of all, um, the, the issue of sort of intergenerational fairness. Um, as both Lance and I have said, social care is something that all of us need uh, at different points in our lives. So actually getting this right is not an issue of one generation against another. It's an issue of what we all need. And I do believe that there is actually a lot more that unites the generations than sometimes popular narrative would suggest. Many people have older people that matter to them. Many people have younger people that matter to them. And actually, I think it's extremely unhelpful to position this as an intergenerational issue. I think this is a wider societal issue. If we get this right, we all, we all benefit. I think the point about why is it taking so long, you know, 20 years at least that uh, we've been discussing and debating this. If you look over to England, I can't, you know, I've lost count of the number of green papers and white papers they've had on social care and the nettle hasn't been grasped. Um, I think we're in a different place now, partly actually because I think COVID has demonstrated clearly how important and vital social care is, how important and vital lots of people who are key workers, whether you're you know, working in the supermarket or, or wherever, actually how much we rely on them. So I think there's a public will that is potentially here now that might not have been here, you know, even a year ago, that makes it maybe a politically more acceptable area to go into. And I actually think we'll see here in Wales, uh, all the main political parties be putting some, some um, uh, proposals, some, some promises really on social care into the manifestos. We, we know they are already looking at this. And actually, I think that does give us a, a step forward. And the other issue is we've got more ability to do that now here in terms of power. So we've got more ability to take decisions here in Wales. Now it would be so much easier if across England and Wales we were able to have the same decisions on this for all sorts of reasons that we know about. We also know in light of recent events that getting agreement between different nations in the UK on some fundamental issues isn't, isn't easy. So I think that that is an issue because I don't I don't expect England to go down the route at the moment which would be the route that Marx and I have been talking about frankly. I think uh, over there, it's much more framed in a very narrow way about, you know, avoiding having to sell your home to pay for care. And that's a, only a small part of, of what this is all about. So I'm relatively optimistic here in terms of what we might do in Wales and what the Welsh government and other parties might do. I'm quite pessimistic about the situation over in England. And that, I think, will have a bearing on, on how effective we can be um, on, on this ourselves. Thank you, Helena. <clears throat> Lance, do you, do you have any reflection on the intergenerational issue? Um, I, I, I suppose I, I would agree with Helena. I think that there, there, there's lots in common between, between uh, the, the, the different ages in terms of, of, of needs and so on. And I th but I, I suppose I think we often see them presented in very different ways. And I think that that's probably built on our, our own stereotypes um, that but actually we can we can imagine different pictures when we're picturing an older person than we perhaps with a younger adult with with learning disability when we're talking about the type of provision that they they may may have I, I suppose what what I would hope is that we're able to learn across from from those those different things um, I mean the demand is also very very different uh, I, I, I don't imagine there's a uh, 60 bed nursing home for adults with learning disabilities. I, th I, th I think, you know, we have to accept that there, there is going to be sig significant va variation. But I, th I suppose the, the, is the issue to me is I think there's some really interesting models across the piece. And I think, you know, that all of those that focus on what, what matters to an individual that actually give them greater levels of choice and control and give them greater levels of independence, regardless of their age, I think really help. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to turn to uh, another uh, topic that uh, I, I raised in, in your presentations and come through in questions, for instance, from, uh, from John Ray, um, which is saying, um, to what extent is the way forward through organisational reform? In other words, 
know, there's often a debate about should social care become part of the NHS? Um, should you bring the two together? Um, uh, should we have a national care service? Those sorts of discussions. Um, and often they're, uh, they're things that where, where the political world often tends to focus at, at, on organizational uh, structural issues of that kind. To what extent do you think that should be a priority um, in, in, in get, going forward? Or do you think this is a distraction from other more important things? Helena. Um, it could be a distraction. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that a big organisation upheaval right now is, is what's required. I think if I look at where there is effective social care services and provision, uh, it's often about leadership and about culture organisations and, and how that is done. So I think the right sort of cultural approach to social care is actually incredibly important, one that is based on, on rights, about respecting people's rights and working with them. Um, I do think there's an issue around the uh, way in which social care is viewed and the priority that it's given. So one thing I think would help actually, which is a, a, an organisational thing and something I've, I've, I put in my recent uh, report called Leave No One Behind, is I think we need a chief social care officer in Welsh Government. So in a similar way to we have a, a chief nursing officer and a chief medical officer, you know, social care is so important and so complex. I think we need that sort of uh, senior professional voice at the heart of Welsh Government in our decision making, in our policy making, in our resource discussions to really make sure that, that, that social care's voice, if you like, is, is at the centre of those decisions. Um, I think there are things also that we can do organisationally that are not necessarily big structural organisational issues but would make things much better and, and that's about starting from the position of uh, the person that needs social care and looking at the system through their eyes and what needs to be improved. So access I think is a, is a key one um, and the right sort of information advice and advocacy at the right time for people would also make a difference. If we, if we accept that actually the, the best way forward would be free personal care, that will help to remove some of the organisational barriers that are currently there, as, as, as Lance said. So there's something about the funding mechanism and what is funded then it, that in and of itself will improve the, the organisational structures that people are trying to work in. Thank you. Lance, you, you, you spoke a bit about some of these sorts of issues in, in your presentation. Um, to what extent do you think um, organizational change, structural change is, is fundamental to any reform agenda? I think I fear probably more that it would be a distraction. Um, I, I, I suppose when, whenever we integrate one thing and bring one thing closer together, we run the risk of creating an interface elsewhere. So at the moment, I suppose if you put social care, um, presumably just adult social care in with the NHS, does that then create an interface with children's social care? Does it create an interface with housing, uh, the councils? So, so I suppose what, you have to be careful that whenever you're bringing something together, you're not, you're not just moving the problem somewhere else, really. Uh, and, and so I suppose I, I would be cautious from, from that. I suppose in terms of that, that central leadership, um, you know, I, I consider Albert Heaney and his team to be expected to be providing that that now um i i i mean i'm conscious that that between health and social care i wouldn't say that was necessarily a level playing field um i i think you know inevitably the health service has a a, a a much stronger focus from the media and from from people very concerned about how, how it's operating uh, and and directly employs all of its staff the because social care you know commissions staff from from uh, a wide variety of independent providers as you've just described today i don't think it's necessarily necessarily seen in that whole context i think it, it tends to be seen as just local authorities uh, and um you know their social work staff and so on whereas it's clearly clearly much bigger thank you um can i just turn to i mean we're getting lots of questions so thank you all very much i'm afraid we won't have time to cover uh, even a third of them i don't think um 
but that in itself just shows how live and important an issue this is and there's clearly much scope for much further debate and discussion about all this. Um, I wanted to come to a point raised by um, Laura McAllister about informal care, um, again something that you, 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 you both referred to um, and her point is um, that, the, that investing in informal care um, has wider dividends such as releasing uh, women into the workplace, not to mention equality benefits. Um, now, um, uh, there have been carer strategies in the past. Um, where, where do you think a carer strategy for the future might need to go in terms of support for, um, uh, for informal care, bearing in mind its significance in terms of the total volume of care there is? Elena. Yeah, we, we, need a, we need a significant shift. Um, so as I said earlier, I, I, I don't think this is an area where we can progress incrementally and things will be okay. So you know, mo most care is provided by family and friends and frankly the NHS would fall over if that wasn't the case. So the very first thing we have to do is to think about how we support people to provide care and many of us will be juggling work and care. So we'll be you know, doing paid work and also unpaid, work, unpaid care and work. And that will increase. And we know that the peak age at which you're likely to care is in your kind of you know, late, late 40s into your 60s, often when you're a very valuable employee uh, to your employer. And we know that there is an economic consequence of people having to leave work in order to care. And that has a, an economic hit that frankly we can't afford. It also has a, a hit on, on individuals and, and families. So unless we significantly scale up the support for unpaid carers, we will face a worsening situation and we will also face knock-on consequences for the NHS. So to give an example of that, one of the things that we're seeing, not just here in Wales, but across the country, is uh, more carers breaking down because they can no longer cope with caring, particularly because a lot of services have been shut because of COVID. So people caring 24 seven for someone who's very frail and living with dementia, uh, but not getting respite, not, not getting daycare support, for example. And we can see the consequences of that where, where you can have two people going into hospital. So the carer breaks down, so has to go into hospital, but the person they're caring for then has to go into hospital as well because the, the carer isn't there. So, these are, these are real human costs and real costs to our economy if they're not sorted. So the Welsh Government um, is, is consulting on a new care strategy. It has an opportunity to really reset the level of support and awareness and funding that goes into supporting carers. There needs to be much better work across the system, actually, across both NHS and social care. First of all, to enable people to know their carers because often you don't realise it and you don't realise there might be help uh, available. And employers have a role too. So employers need to make sure that they have carer friendly policies and are, are thinking about support for carers in the workforce in the same way that they began to think about support for parents in their workforce 30 or 40 years ago. Thank you. Oh. I completely agree with H H Helena, and I, I suppose I, I probably, um, I, I just wish I knew the answer um, to, to this. Um, it's, it's one of these areas where I suppose progressively we've, we've looked at increasing, you know, um, the number of carers assessments we offer, we're, we're trying to promote that at every stage, but we don't see great engagement with that. We see a lot of people choose to opt out. and that. There has to be a reason behind that, and I suspect that is a is a, a re would require a wider system shift. If if I'm honest, I suspect people think I'm not going to get anything. It's not going to help me to go through this process. And actually, the person I'm caring for is getting what they need, so that will be okay. And and I'll muddle on. And I I completely agree with with how Helena presented it because I I you know we are seeing the breakdown of 
of of whole relationships and and well not whole relationship but sorry the whole household because of this this um difficulty when when somebody just cannot cope any, any longer um but we've we've tried to increase the range of services we try to be a little bit more creative in terms of how we can respond we try to get people to engage in those those assessments but i don't think that's worked i i think we it, it will have helped but i don't think it's been enough and i think i think it probably requires a wider system shift than than the expectation that social services can come along and 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 resolve it um it, it seems to me to be much more sub substantial than that thank you well look we're, uh, we've probably only got time for one more more question um and thank you very much for the contribution so far um one it comes from Rhea Stevens, um, who says that the issue is far broader than health and social care integration, especially if an ambition is to offer people options closer to their homes and communities. An obvious partner to support this work is housing. Um, I welcome the panel's thoughts on resources that we can draw on from beyond the traditional boundaries in health and social care, and what actions might help us make progress. So how? You know, is how do we build a kind of whole systems response? Helena, do you have any thoughts on? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, would, I would agree. Housing is fundamental. I mean, it's fundamental to all of us, isn't it? And the importance of home um, and having the right housing can either enable you or disable you, really. So it's fundamental. And I, I'd pick up Lance's point earlier around wherever, wherever you, you know, draw a line in a system, you're going to have to work across it. So this is always going to be about how we work across whatever boundaries there are whether that's between housing health and care or indeed within those services them, themselves and you know where i see really great work and successful work happening it's where people are working across those boundaries and working collaboratively with a common goal and we've got some great examples here in wales so you know i think we it's important also to recognize the very good work that's happening and the good practice so we've got some, some models and services which are popular. So things like extra care housing, where you retain your own flat or apartment, you retain your rights, actually, uh, your housing rights, which is a really important point. You have greater rights in a extra care housing than you do in a, in a care home where you don't have those housing rights. So you retain that sense of independence and control, but you have care on site. And that's an increasingly popular service model. And of there's some great examples of how um, housing associations are working with social services and health boards to develop that. Um, and we probably need to see more of that as well. I think there's, there's a growing demand for that. Um, so housing has a, has a critical role to play, as does, as Kian alluded to in his presentation, looking at those other funding streams. So, you know, I, I want us here in Wales to, to lead the UK in maximising the amount of money uh, we get from the Treasury in, in terms of social security and other benefits. So attendance allowance, pension credit for older people. If we invested a little more here in ensuring people got the financial support to which they are legally entitled, that would help them and it would also help our, our wider issue about paying for, for care and support. So a really practical way in which we can in, invest to save. Thank you very much. That's the only final words before we sign off. Um, I, I suppose I, I always think with the boundaries and uh, and that these lines tend to be drawn by us um, and, and actually people don't want those lines <laughs> um, but but we we do this all the time we compartmentalize and have different departments and segments and and and, and so on and so I think we have to recognize that and actually it's our job to make sure that those lines are are very blurred and sketchy and that we can just move through 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 them I suppose I I just reiterate the point I made earlier is that by keeping it local um, we've got we've had really really incredible um, innovative uh, ways of delivering services um, there are lots of other partners we can work with community libraries other public services you know we've worked with the fire service and and and, and so on have been really helpful um, but I, I suppose I, I I need to mention the voluntary sector, which I don't think has really come out today. And I think I think some of the work that they do is absolutely incredible, and it keeps it keeps them from the statutory sector. It keeps individuals from the statutory sector. It it enables people to be independent and actually contribute and feel worthwhile and part of a community. 
and and actually that's that's far more valuable than 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 the the work that that we do and, and i you know i probably shouldn't mention an individual um organization but but we've certainly got examples in the vale of glamorgan where i i could could show you a a uh, village that has its own uh voluntary organization that essentially provides a day service transport to shops um checks on people delivers food all those all those things that actually probably aren't in the social care arena quite so much anymore because we're concentrating on the, on, on on complex needs and, and and care but actually without them we'd be lost and um, so I, i'll stop there thank you very much indeed well thank you both very much for all your contributions thank you all for taking part and for asking your questions um we weren't able to get to anything like all the questions but uh we'll see if we can find ways of of, of getting responses to them but thank you all very much indeed and we'll and we'll sign off enjoy the rest of your day thank you very much <laughs>